A useful concept for both electromagnetism and gravity is the idea of a field. We introduced this last semester as little g, and for the first few weeks we treated it as a uniform field, meaning it has the same magnitude and direction everywhere. Of course we know that's not right, since that direction is towards the center of the Earth, and that changes as you move across the Earth's surface. The size of the field also changes in magnitude, since the field is weaker as we move away from the surface. It just has to, we just have to move a long way before it's noticeable. The field is kind of a placeholder and let us, let us talk about what the force on a mass would be even if there wasn't a mass there at the time. Force per unit mass is also an acceleration and that's why we used it in the first week or two of class. For electrostatics, on the other hand, we define an electric field as the force per unit of what responds to that force. In this case, it's charge, so our units would be newtons per coulomb. How do we find this electric field? We look at the gravitational example. Little g was Newton's law of gravity divided by the size of the test mass. So this gives us the gravitational field for this mass m, which in that case would have been mass of the Earth. For Coulomb's law, we can also use k, q1, q2 over r squared and divide by the size of one of the charges, which we'll call the test charge, to find the electric field. This is the form of the electric field for a point charge, kq over r squared, and we'll see that you actually get this when you're outside of any spherically symmetric charge distribution. We get the same thing for gravity, but we don't have to worry about it for gravity because anything that has a significant gravitational field will form itself into a sphere anyway. Since E is a vector field, it has a direction and a magnitude at every point in space, and we define the E field to point out of positive charges and into negative charges. If we do this, if we put a positive charge in the E-field, it moves downstream, since the force on it is in the same direction as the field. Negative charges move in the other direction, kind of like the way helium balloons move up instead of down when you let go of them. At this point, we are going to introduce a new notation. The main reason we started using this K in Coulomb's Law is because it makes the similarity between Coulomb's Law and Newton's Law of Gravity obvious. It's more convenient sometimes, though, to write the constant k in a different form. We write it as k equals 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, where this epsilon naught is known as the permittivity of free space, or permittivity of a vacuum, and it has a value of 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12 coulomb squared per newton meter squared. This doesn't change anything, just going from one constant to another, but it changes the way it looks. The point charge form of the E-field expression is useful, but we could write it other ways as well. What if we had a charged line, like some kind of string or dental floss or something with charges glued to it at regular intervals? We could define a linear charge density lambda, and we'd measure it in coulombs per meter, and the total charge would be the integral of that lambda dl, or dx. For a surface charge, we could define a surface charge density sigma as so many coulombs per square meter and we'd find the total charge by integrating sigma dA. Finally, we could talk about volume charge density. We usually use a rho for that, and that would be coulombs per cubic meter, and the total charge associated with that would be the volume integral of rho dV. This will always give us the right answer for the E field, but it's usually an awful lot of work. If we have an irregularly shaped object, like a person, for example, with some non-uniform charge density, and you want to find the E field, due to that charge density at some point p, all you really have to do is kq over r squared, the vector sum of those, over all the zillion charges that make up that object. This is the kind of thing that a computer can do because it's relatively simple and mindless and you can't make any mistakes. It's not the way you want to do it as a person. We can use this for things that are much more symmetric than a person though. One example from your book is to find the field of a long straight line of charge if you're some distance z away from and centered on that line. So we want to find the electric field at this point p. So we have to do our constant 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught and then it's charge over r squared. Our charge here is lambda dl. There's our r squared and r hat is of course our directional indicator. So we have to find the distance of every single little piece of wire, the distance between that and the point we're interested in. That's what's going to go in here. 
we need the Pythagorean theorem to see that this little r is square root of z squared plus x squared. So we can find the distance and it's not too bad. What's a little bit more involved is, since this is a vector field, we have to look at the components of the E field because some of them cancel. For each little piece on the right of this center line, there's a corresponding piece on the left. So the x component should cancel and the y component should add. Well, really z components is what we're calling them. That means the perpendicular component to the wire is all that we care about. That component we would write as cosine theta if we're using this as our theta. And cosine can also be written as adjacent over hypotenuse or z over r. So the integral we want to do is our constant. We go from negative L over 2 to L over 2 since we're in the center of the wire. We have lambda over, this is our r squared, our distance. And then our cosine theta looks like z over r, which is that. And we're integrating over x because that's where we're moving along our charge. This can be simplified to look like this. That's not a horrible integral. It may not be much fun, but it's, it's certainly doable. If you do it, you get lambda L over 2 pi epsilon naught Z, and then square root of L squared plus 4 Z squared. We can rewrite that as lambda over 2 pi epsilon naught Z, square root of 1 plus 4 times Z over L squared. Now, if we let the length of the line go to infinity, we get this, because this part will cancel out. Lambda over 2 pi epsilon naught Z. Here the E field is dropping off as 1 over the distance, we would say 1 over R, rather than 1 over R squared for a point charge. This is a fundamentally different system than a point charge. What if instead we want to find the E field at the center and above a ring of charge? This is still a linear charge density, but now the ends are touching. So what we have to do, we have to move along this. Our distance is square root of R squared plus z squared, and this is big R, where big R is the size of the ring, and z is our distance to point P, this integral is going to look a lot like the last one. Little r is the distance from the point of interest to the tiny piece of charge dq that is square root of r squared plus z squared away. We have the same cancellation of the parallel components that we had before, so again we want cosine of what they've got as phi here. So cosine of phi is again z over little r, which is z over square root of big R squared plus z squared. Our tiny element of charge dq can be written as lambda r d theta, since the length along the arc is r d theta. We rewrite this and get 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. We integrate from 0 to 2 pi over theta, and we have lambda r over r squared plus z squared times z over square root of r squared plus z squared. This doesn't look fun, but it turns out it's, it's almost trivial because nothing in this integral depends on theta. It can all go outside, and the theta integral just gives us 2 pi. When we work it all out, we get lambda rz over 2 epsilon naught times, the one point, times r squared plus z squared to the 1.5. Uh, what we could do instead of cancel out that 2 pi in the numerator and the denominator, we could use 2 pi lambda r as the total charge, and we could write qz is 4 pi epsilon naught times r squared plus z squared to the 3 halves. If we go to the limit where we're very far away from the ring compared to its radius, that means z is much, much greater than big R, this part goes away and we get total charge over 4 pi epsilon naught z squared. Notice this is exactly what a point charge would look like. So if we're very far away from the ring, we can't tell it from a point as long as we're oriented like this. Finally, what's a little bit harder, we could imagine we replace the ring by a disk. So now we have a surface charge density and we have to integrate over the area rather than around the ring. Now the integral of lambda dl over r becomes the integral of sigma dA over r squared. We still need the cosine term and we need it for the same reason. The area element dA, we find this by imagining a tiny little piece of the ring dQ with the thickness dR prime, that's radial, and a length r prime d theta, because theta is the other polar coordinate. They are not using that here, but that's what we'll use. 
since integrating zero to, from d theta from zero to two pi gives us a factor of two pi, that'll be easy enough. Now we go back and use theta the way the picture does. What we get is the area element dA is two pi r prime dr prime, and the distance to point p from that area element is the square root of z squared plus r prime squared. Right, there's our r prime, there's z, there's our distance. Cosine theta is again z over square root of z squared plus r prime squared. We have to integrate over all r prime, so when we do that we write this out and it looks like a little bit of a mess than it is, but we can simplify it to sigma over 2 epsilon naught multiplied by 1 minus z over square root of r squared plus z squared. If we get very far away from this, this will also look like a point charge, but you'd have to do an expansion to figure that out. On the other hand, if you're very close to the surface, so z is much less than r, you get e is sigma over 2 epsilon naught, which means the field is independent of distance. The way you can understand this is, as you move away from the disk, you expect the field strength to drop off as 1 over r squared, but you also get to see more of the disk as you go up. Just like you would in a helicopter, you get to see more of the Earth as your altitude increases. The extra charge we see is proportional to r squared, so that exactly cancels out the drop-off of 1 over r squared, and we get a constant E-field. Later, we'll use this idea to make a uniform E-field. If we take a positively charged plane of charge density sigma and put it near and parallel to a negatively charged plane with charge density negative sigma, the field inside will be uniform and equal to the sum of the fields, or just sigma over epsilon naught. The behavior of a charge in a uniform field is just like the behavior in a mass of a mass in Earth's gravitational field in early physics one, where we said g was constant. You could use the kinematic equations to find the connections between position, velocity, and acceleration of a charge released between these plates as functions of time. Now, of course, we don't really have infinitely large plates that we can use, so why do we care about this? The reason is, if the separation between the plates is small compared to their size, and we stay away from the edges, it looks like this, so that's why it's useful. Now, as we mentioned before, most objects are electrically neutral because they are equal numbers of positive and negative charges. Because of this, a dipole is a very useful idea. This is, a, if we have a single charge, either positive or negative, we call it a monopole. If we have one positive and one negative charge bound to each other, that's a dipole. We can define a dipole moment as a vector, P is Q times D, if the two charges are plus Q and minus Q, and they're separated by a distance D. Notice this is a vector. We define D to point from the negative charge to the positive charge. That's the opposite of the electric field convention we just established that says E points away from positive charges and towards negative. The reason we do this is this way a dipole will line up with an electric field in such a way that P is parallel to E when it's in its lowest energy state. The units of P have to be Coulomb meters. If we put a single charge in a uniform electric field, we know it'll accelerate either with or against the field depending on its charge at a rate QE over M just force divided by mass. On the other hand, if we put a dipole in the uniform field, what will happen? The two charges feel exactly the same force, but in opposite directions, so we get a torque, as shown in this figure from your book. The lever arm of the torque would be d over 2, and the force would be QE. So each charge produces a torque, and they act in the same direction. In this case, this is counterclockwise. The total torque is then Q positive in the E field times D over 2 sine theta plus Q negative in the E field D over 2 sine of theta. The net result is they combine constructively and we get P cross E. This means the dipole will rotate so that plus Q is downstream in the E field and minus Q is upstream, so P is parallel to E. Even though there's a torque acting on the dipole, the net force is zero. If we have a uniform field, the dipole will rotate, but it won't translate. It'll sit still in that spot. Its center of mass won't move. If we look at the energy stored in a dipole in an electric field, we can write that as the dot product of P and E, rather than the cross product. We get a negative sign here. The reason is the lowest energy state is when the dipole is aligned with the field. There we get U equals negative PE, 
If it's anti-aligned, that's the highest energy state, and our zero of energy would be if P was perpendicular to E. We can consider the dipoles we just looked at to be permanent dipoles, and that means they exist whether there's a field to rotate them or not. Water is a permanent dipole. If you have just one water molecule by itself, the positive charge and the negative charge separate. The electrons from hydrogen spend more time at the oxygen atom, so they may get more negative and the hydrogen's more positive overall. Helium atom, on the other hand, is not polarized. The two electrons in the lowest energy state shield the two protons in the nucleus. It's spherically symmetric. It's electrically neutral. If we put it in an electric field, though, we tend to push the electron probability clouds upstream and the nucleus slightly downstream. Even in a strong electric field, the center of the electron clouds won't be far from the center of the nucleus because the electric field from the nucleus is huge for the electrons. This is an induced dipole. Uh, the helium would also be expected to have a fluctuating dipole moment because if you imagine taking a snapshot of where those electrons are, if we could locate them precisely, at one instant, it's very unlikely they'll be on exactly opposite sides of the nucleus. They'll just be in random spots, and they probably won't completely cancel each other out. That means we will have some dipole moment that fluctuates from instant to instant. Because that dipole moment will cause a field of its own, that will induce dipoles in nearby helium atoms. And the interaction between these dipoles produces the van der Waals force that you may have heard of. That's what lets helium liquefy if you get down to a few Kelvin. There is a related effect. You can run a comb through your hair and then use it to pick up tiny pieces of paper, or styrofoam, something like that. The comb is building up a charge just like a glass rod rubbed with fur, and the little pieces of paper must be neutral initially because if they were either positively or negatively charged, they would repel each other. So dipoles are induced by the field, but why is there a net force on the paper? The reason is the field of the comb in any finite body is non-uniform, so we don't have cancellation. If the comb is positive, the induced dipoles line up so the negative ends are closer to the comb but they're in a stronger field than the positive ends, so the two forces don't exactly cancel. The attraction is greater than the repulsion. We could figure this out by just using vector addition on the fields to see what we'll get. If we arrange it so that the center of the dipole is at the origin and the axis is along the z-axis, we get E is the sum of E plus and E minus. We can simplify this and get this expression, which doesn't look very simple. We can also use an approximation. You might think, why do we do that when we have the exact answer? The reason is, in general, if we're working at the human scale, our separation from this, the center of this dipole, is huge compared to the size of the dipole, since the size of it is an atomic radius. That means we have this approximation instead, p over 2 pi epsilon naught z cubed. We notice that this field drops off as 1 over r cubed instead of 1 over r squared, which we found for isolated single charges. If we happen to put two oppositely oriented dipoles near each other, we could make a quadrupole. The field from that would drop off as 1 over r to the fourth.